the film camera is one of the most important inventions of the 20th century. After all, film cameras are what led us down the road to getting smaller and more advanced digital cameras, like the ones in smartphones. But film cameras haven't died out. Many famous filmmakers and artists still shoot on film, sometimes for the aesthetics and often for other reasons. In this video, we'll be looking at film cameras and how they work. Let's begin by breaking down the basic components of a film camera. You may have heard of all the different cameras out there. Single lens reflex, twins lens reflex, point and shoot, instant, there are just way too many types of cameras. But all of them have three essential components that are common across all film cameras. These are the lens, film, and the camera body. For today's video, our explanation of how a camera works will be based on a single lens reflex camera. This is about as basic as a camera can get, but we will talk about the differences between SLR and other types of cameras. An SLR camera is what you see is what you get camera that allows the photographer to see exactly what the camera saw. Any edits or tweaks that they might want to make to the image will have to happen in the darkroom. The creation of a photo begins with the lens. What is a lens and how does it work? Well, a lens is just a curved piece of any transparent material. Glass or plastic is standard, but while the material is important in a lens, is the curvature that's key to allowing a lens to do what it does. The only way anything, including our eyes, can see is by the reflection of light off the objects around us, and curving the lens allows more light to enter into it than if it had been flat. You might be thinking that this would create a fisheye effect, but there's a bit of math that goes into how the lenses are curved. Light moves through the air in the forms of waves, and when they encounter a curved lens, some waves and some parts of a wave will enter the lens before others. Not to mention the fact that the speed of light through air is different, much faster in fact, than the speed of light in plastic or glass. This process is known as refraction, and lens designers have a set of equations on hand that allow them to calculate the exact way in which light will refract from a lens. They can then curve the lens in a way that gets them the desired results. As cool as the refraction stuff is, what does it have to do with cameras? The goal of the lens is to take as much of the light in front of it as possible and focus it onto a point inside the camera. That point is going to be on the film, naturally, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. There are actually many different lenses out there, and a professional photographer will usually have an arsenal of lens in their bag. Without getting into all the terminology that goes into lenses, we'll just say that different lenses allow you to do different things with your camera. Some lenses are really long, which lets you get very close to your subject to capture every single detail. Others are really wide, allowing you to capture a panoramic shot of the scene in front of you. Plastic lenses have a different vibe from glass lenses. If you were to take two lenses of the same spec from different manufacturers, the final shot would still look slightly different, so you can see how the lenses alone are a massive rabbit hole that photography geeks can fall into. So the lenses capture the scene. What's next? We're going to skip over the camera body for now and move on to the role of the film in this story. The camera body basically controls the photo capturing process, so it's better we know that process inside and out before we try to control it. What is film anyway? Photographic film is basically a strip of film base, which is a paper-like sheet covered in a photographic emulsion. The emulsion is a liquid that has tiny crystals, often of silver halide, floating inside it, and this emulsion coats one side of the film strip. Those crystals are light sensitive and will turn dark when exposed to a quick burst of light, say a burst of light coming from a lens in front of it. If you look at a film strip after you've taken pictures with it, you'll find that the colors are all wrong and actually kind of scary. This isn't the final result at all. It's actually something called the photo negative because all the colors are reversed on the film. You take these negatives to a dark room where a professional will use the negatives to produce the actual photo you're looking for. Photos are developed by putting the negatives through a complicated chemical process with a substance that contains dye couplers. The emulsion is transferred to the paper, which will contain the final photo. Through the chemical process, dye couplers attach in the appropriate spots of the negative while the silver halide is removed, leaving just the dyes behind. All those colored dyes get together to form the photo that you'll pick up later. We've covered the essentials of film photography, but there's some nuance to getting the right shot. Let's look at the mechanisms inside the camera's body. If you look at a professional camera, you'll find the top and sides covered with different dials and buttons that allow the photographer to get exactly the right shot. For our purposes though, we're going to take a look at the most important one of those functions that anyone taking pictures should probably know about, exposure. There are two variables that are going to have a huge impact on what your final result is going to look like. How much light is being allowed into the camera and how long that light exposure lasts. The amount of light that you allow into the camera obviously factors into how bright your image is going to be. You want to make sure that the subject and the background are visible and you have a nice amount of detail. But if you let in too much light, you'll overexpose the image and blow it out. Think back to those old school science experiment pinhole cameras. The size of the pinhole determines the amount of light that comes through. Except we're talking about real cameras now, so we need a fancy term for that pinhole. Aperture. A camera's aperture has something called an 
an iris diaphragm. This is just a pair of metal sheets that can pull apart or come together to adjust the size of the aperture. The wider open the aperture, the more light that comes in and the brighter the image. As for the length of the exposure, that comes from the shutter speed. You can imagine what a camera shutter is just by the name. It's yet another pair of metal sheets that suddenly cut off the entry of light into the camera, freezing an image on the film. A photographer can adjust how long it takes for a shutter to, well, shut. Shutter speed is a very versatile thing that photographers can control. A fast shutter speed can allow you to take pictures of moving objects without blur, while a slow shutter speed can allow tons of light in for still subjects. A film camera is a very mechanical thing, full of nuts and bolts and gears. If you ever break one open, you'll be surprised at how much they look like old-timey watches on the inside. Digital cameras are a lot less complex than film cameras, but some photographers and videographers swear by the results of film, but that's a matter of opinion. We've been looking at single-lens reflex cameras. What other camera types are there? A counterpart to the bulky SLR cameras is the rangefinder camera. It uses the mirror mechanisms that used in the viewfinder of an SLR camera to fine-tune focus instead. This makes for a very compact camera that can focus at a variety of distances without changing lenses. It's a great travel companion for amateur and professional photographers. But what if the content of this video was too complicated and you want your camera to take care of all this nonsense for you? Point and shoot is both the type of camera and the philosophy of camera design. In today's age of computational photography, and image processing. You really could offload all the heavy lifting and dialing in the perfect shot and let the camera do it instead. All you have to do is point and shoot. You could get a point and shoot camera, but truthfully, the one on the back of the device you're watching this video on might be good enough. One type of camera that's making a minor comeback among photography nerds is the instant camera. Polaroid took the entire process of shooting and developing an image and built it all into a single machine that can shoot, develop, and print the photo in a matter of minutes. You do lose a bunch of fine controls over things like shutter speed, and aperture size, but these cameras were also designed for amateur users. The things that were considered weaknesses of Polaroids are now considered part of the vibe. Today, a company masquerading as Polaroid is slapping the name on some instant cameras. And another really popular series is the Fujifilm Instax line. That's it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.